go. Buongiorno carissimi, buongiorno famiglia, buongiorno amici, buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti. Questo giorno non stranieri qui, tutti famiglia. This day, no strangers, everyone is family. This is our third live recording of Tales from Sweet Hollow here at the wonderful St. Paul Brewing. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. They are so kind. We are very happy to be here at St. Paul Brewing because we are right in the shadow of Sweet Hollow. So, and many of you will remember that this used to be at one time in its life, Ham's Brewery. Ham's Brewery where everyone on the east side worked at some time or another. Sweet Hollow was home to many colorful characters, all of them real, all memorable, and all worthy of a story. But the main character in our stories is Sweet Hollow itself. So how do you get to that magical place and how do you turn the clock back a hundred years? Well, with a nod to Ginty Yeruso, Sarah will take us there. Ooh. How to enter the magical world of Sweet Hollow. Coming from the north, follow the peddlers through the tunnel. Brooms, fruits, vegetables, and rags. The ragman's cart is so wide he barely makes it through. So it takes a little longer. His big gray horse is so patient and gentle. And so is the ragman, pretending he doesn't know the kids are taking stuff from the back of the cart and trying to resell it to him. Coming from the south, take the steps. Don't be surprised by the little boys carrying a big sack of soft rolls. The baker puts them out by the back door of the store and lets the boys steal them. In winter, you can grab a piece of cardboard and slide down one of the many hills that lead from the street to the frozen creek. Watch out for trees. In summer, sail in on the rope that swings out across the binder dump. Get a good running start, or you may land in the creek, or worse yet, in the dump. The railroad runs right through Sweet Hollow. You could ride in on an empty grain car, and if a pusher is needed to get the heavy coal cars up the grade, the train will stop and wait right above the Sanchelli's house. You'll find Signora Sanchelli and Signora Deloya. Antonetta and Maria up on the coal car, throwing free coal into the Sanchelli's backyard for all to burn throughout the cold winter. The Sanchelli house is easy to find. It has a big red tin Coca-Cola sign for a roof. And by the way, the Capras have moved up on the street. We'll miss them, but there's another family moving in soon, and word has it that the grandmother is a fortune teller. And you'll know you've arrived when you see the creek running the whole length of the hollow, and when you hear the bell from Lincoln School calling the children up to the paths to the school up on the street. And when you smell the aroma of warm bread just out of the bread oven, enjoy your time here. Before you leave, don't forget to carve your initials in the outhouse. But who actually lived in Sweet Hollow? Who are the characters that lived in Sweet Hollow? Sam will let us know. The Characters of Sweet Hollow by Jerry Hurd. There were many characters in Sweet Hollow with nicknames, a list of which will follow. There was old lady Margaret, once a famous actress, who lived in a house with a pet chicken, no less. There was Grandma St. Germain, the fortune-telling seer. With predictions of the futures, she would bend your ear. How about Fatty Joe, the ice cream man, filling basic needs, his girth, with regular pasta feeds? A young man named Eaglebeak 
had a very proud nose, but the name he was called was not the one was, that he chose. A bachelor named Bananas sold his some home brew, suddenly left for Italy so his life he wouldn't lose. A young boy named Patsy couldn't speak nor hear, but his mind was sharp as the tip of a spear. Old Peg Leg ran the binder dump with an iron fist, and woe be to those who were on his list. Zia Nicolina was Sweet Hollow's de facto mayor. She was the neighborhood's main power player. A proud papa named Tony who loved the USA and was dutiful, and every night on the bridge he sang America the Beautiful. The mischievous boy Nua caused many frustrations, but his older brother Mikey rescued him from situations. Remember Huntsy and Buncy and the Hanson brothers? They were the pride and the joy of their doting mother. Mrs. Knudsen's grandson, Buddy, who didn't think twice about trading ice cream for an onion sandwich just to be nice. Frenchie, who could only drive his car in a straight line till it ran out of gas and abandoned it, and that was fine. The hermit whose house on stilts was one room, he felt safe until a tragic fire in which he met his doom. The little kids searched the ashes for the gold that was in his teeth, or so they were told. Little Joey had the mumps and took a pass. He was the only sweet kid in Sweet Hollow not covered in ash. The story is called The Dollhouse. It was a beautiful day in Sweet Hollow, bright and sunny and full of promise. Two little girls are sitting up there on the banks of the creek, sitting on a tattered old blanket and working hard on a project. They are named Giannina and Paulina. They are first cousins, best friends, and soon to be in the third grade at Lincoln School. Now they would have called this a special day, and here's why. Just that very morning, their older sisters had decided that since they were the older sisters, they were going to pass on the care of their beloved dollies, Conchetta and Donatella, to the younger sisters. And the younger sisters, Giannina and Paulina, promised to take good care of the dollies. And also that very same day, Janina and Paulina had decided that lots of kids at Lincoln School weren't Italian, and everybody seemed to be going to an American name. So they decided that from now on, they were going to be called Jenny and Polly, and the new dollies were going to be called Connie and Donna. And in honor of the whole thing, the girls had spent the entire morning running around Sweet Hollow looking for all kinds of material to make a brand new wardrobe for the new dollies. They found a scrap of this and a snitch of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and someone gave them a whole pile of socks that had too many holes to, to be mended anymore and those little resourceful girls thought, what a nice soft bed for our dollies. They heard a clattering sound and they looked down and coming up the pathway from the binder dump, they saw two boys pushing a wheelbarrow, a rickety old wheelbarrow, and this wheelbarrow was full of treasure. Old lumber, some old shingles, two bags of gently used nails, a rusty old saw, and swinging from one of the boys' belt loops was a hammer. Now well, the boys got up to where the girls were working and they said, what are you girls doing? Because they were dying to show somebody their treasures. And the girls said, we're making new clothes for Connie and Donna. And just at that moment, you could see the light bulb go on over the boys' heads. You girls are in luck, said Joey. Look at all this stuff we got from the binder dump. We could make a dollhouse for your dollies. Oh, said the girls. 
That will be wonderful. Could it have a door and windows? Sure, said the boys. We're good carpenters. We can do that. Can it have a roof on it, too? Yes, said the boys. We are good carpenters. We can put a roof on this dollhouse. So the girls, too young to be skeptical, <laughs> said, all right, we're going to go make the curtains. Off they went to make the curtains, and the boys set right to work making the dollhouse. They worked and worked and worked, and really, before long, they had a very respectable structure. It was four squares, it had a roof, it had a door, it had windows cut out. It was really a pretty nice dollhouse. They were just putting the finishing touches on the dollhouse when the frogs in the creek heard Sammy yell, Hey, watch where you're swinging that hammer, Joey. You almost hit my thumb. And Joey said, Well, maybe you should keep your hand out of my way when I'm trying to drive a nail. And Sammy said, Drive a nail? What are you talking about? And Joey said, you should keep your hand out of my way, and you should watch where you leave that saw, that rusty old saw. I almost stepped on it with my bare feet, and then I would have got lockjaw, and then I would never be able to talk again. <laughs> and Sammy said, oh, you can always talk. What you can't do is pound a nail. <laughs> oh, yeah, said Joey. Look at those window holes. I could have got a beaver from the creek to cut better holes out than that. <gasps> oh, yeah, said Sammy. Well, I think you're a crummy carpenter. <sighs> I think you're a crummy carpenter, said Joey. Well, I think this is a dumb dollhouse, said Sammy. Well, I agree, said Joey. And with that, Sammy took the hammer slammed it on top of the dollhouse roof with all his might, wrapped his skinny little arms around that dollhouse and started rocking it back and forth and rocking and rocking and rocking, much to the horror of Joey because it started to creak. And then it started to show a few cracks. And then pieces started to fall off of this thing. Joey said, Sammy! You're wrecking the dollhouse. But Sammy wasn't even hearing it. He was busy rocking that thing back and forth and watching it fall to pieces. Joey jumped onto, or threw himself onto the ground as fast as he could, try to salvage whatever he could of the dollhouse. That was a lot of work. <laughs> and Sammy doubled down, wrapped his arms around it as tight as he could, gave it one giant heave. And with that, the dollhouse crumbled to the ground and the hammer slid down off of the roof and hit Joey in the back of the neck, leaving a groove that he carried with him till his death at age 95. <laughs> now, wrecking the dollhouse wouldn't have stopped this fight, but the sight of blood did. In Sweet Hollow, people don't have a lot of money for doctors. So if you're bleeding, you better have a darn good reason. <laughs> Joey grabbed the back of his head, ran home, hoping that this would be just bad enough that his mother would feel more pity than anger. And Sammy ran down to plead his case to his mother that this was just a total accident, and anyway, it was all Joey's fault. <laughs> and while they were running away from the dollhouse, two little girls were running back to the dollhouse and they were so happy and chattering and couldn't get over what a wonderful day this was and each one of them was carrying a newly made pair of curtains in her hand. And when they got to the dollhouse and saw it in pieces on the ground, they were absolutely speechless. For the longest time they didn't say one word and then Polly picked up her curtains and said, I made my curtains out of the mapine. I thought the wine stains looked just like flowers. <laughs> and Jenny picked up her curtains and said, 
I cut the whole back out of Papa's shirt, but he'll never know because he always wears a vest. <laughs> Another long time went by, they didn't know what to say. And finally Polly said, what are we going to do? Connie and Donna will be so disappointed. And Jenny looked at it, and she looked at all the stuff, and she said, you know, all the wood is still here. There's still some shingles here. Here's a few nails. There's the saw. We can wipe the blood off the hammer. <laughs> and so those little girls put together, th that dollhouse put it back together, and it looked pretty good. It wasn't perfect, but it still looked like a dollhouse. And in that sweet way that dollies have of talking to little girls, Connie and Donna assured him, them that it was just fine. Now they were just hanging the curtains when they heard another clattering sound coming now this time from the other direction. Now, the two boys walking up the path, one with a great big white bandage on his head, pushing a wheelbarrow, but this time the wheelbarrow was totally empty. And these boys were laughing and having such a great time, and they were the best pals forever. And when they got close enough to within earshot of Jenny, Jenny yelled out the window, how do you like the dollhouse you built? Now the boys, unfamiliar with third grade sarcasm, positioned themselves at the front of the newly made dollhouse. One went one direction, the other went the other direction, and they looked it over real serious. Yeah, they checked to see if it was good and tight and if it, the windows were right and checked it all over, made sure the roof was on good. And when they got back to the front of the dollhouse, they smiled at each other, had a congratulatory handshake, and said, I think we did a pretty good job. Well, Sammy said, we have to go. We have to get back down to the binder dump and get some more materials. We have a new project. We are going to be building a clubhouse. No girls allowed. <laughs> and off they went, arm in arm, happy as could be, leaving the girls to wonder about many things. Now, you might think that there are some natural-born uh, morals to this story, things like, all's well that ends well, or if you want something done right, do it yourself, or Italian men have really hard heads. <laughs> but I think there may be a broader lesson you can learn here. Sammy and Joey and Polly and Jenny were friends throughout their long, long lives. They rejoiced in good times together. They grieved in sad times together. And when they moved up onto the street, as they all did, they brought a piece of Sweet Hollow with them, and they gave it back to us in the form of their wonderful stories. Now, some of you here may be saying, what in the world is the binder dump? Well, we have Jerry here to tell us what it is, and just a warning, he speaks in rhyming couplets. <laughs> How many of you uh, actually lived in Sweet Hollow? How many had relatives who lived in Sweet Hollow? There was a magical place called the Binder Dump, which preceded all shopping centers, all antique stores, <laughs> preceded the Goodwill and the Salvation Army. The people up on the street would bring their broken furniture, shoes, clothing down to the binder dump. And the folks who lived in Sweet Hollow would take advantage of their shopping in a place where, where it was free. But there was something to watch out for, and that was Peg Leg. And I wrote this story, this poem. Archaeologists worldwide dig in the ruins to unearth the history of mankind through some relic of worth. They dutifully scratch at the ground with great care, hoping to unlock some historic treasure there. The kids in East St. Paul's Sweet Hollow dug too, through piles of junk cast off by people who had much to spare of their flotsam and jetsam, 
and with determined digging, they wanted to get some of the possible treasures they could maybe reuse, like bicycles, furniture, clothing, and even old shoes. The binder dump by Sixth Street Bridge was their spot, but they had to be careful not to get caught by the large mustachioed caretaker known as Peg Leg, a fearsome character who had lost his left leg while whaling, while whaling some said in the North Atlantic, and the very sight of him caused the kids to panic. This is my dump, old Peg Leg would say, and if you know it's good for you, you'll stay away. <laughs> he had a big pitchfork and carried a slingshot, and steel nuts and bolts were the ammo, but he still could not dissuade the determined treasure-seeking youngsters the, these Depression-era semi-professional junkers. The binder dump to them was a picker's heaven, and they would go to it early, maybe six or seven. But often Peg Leg was already up to give them a fright, slingshotting steel nuts and bolts at them. It was quite a sight. As they ran and deked and dodged his missiles, taunting Peg Leg with their yells and their whistles, the long-gone binder dump has been relegated to your this wondrous, wondrous treasure-laden place of yore. The next story is a new story to us. It's called The Life of St. Anthony. And just in case we've forgotten what St. Anthony looks like, it's this. <laughs> should Pass be much around. bigger, but anyway, this is St. Anthony. Mrs. Lucy Orlando had beautiful handwriting. She learned to write at Lincoln School using the Palmer method. Her slant was perfect, her letters clear and uniform, so there was no reason why those little boys couldn't learn their lines for the play. Oh, she had heard all the excuses. I have to haul water for Senora Maria. I have to deliver newspapers up on the street. I have to watch the little kids while my mama bakes bread. I have to feed the pigeons up on the trestle. All true, but they could always find time for a softball game when the Hanson boys found an, a usable kitten ball washed up from the storm sewer, or when word got out that the Browing Break Bakery had a bag of day-old rolls out on the loading dock waiting for a bold, quick thief and his buddies. She had heard the Verdi band practicing up on Sal's Hill and put her pen down. Accordions, mandolins, horns, and harmonicas all trying to learn the song that Father Pioletti had brought from Italy, a song with lots of verses people could sing while marching in procession. She could almost hear the melody coming through the collection of sounds. Almost. Father had asked her to write a play, The Life of St. Anthony, he would call it, to be presented following the feast day mass. She could picture it, the large statue of the beloved saint holding the Christ child in his arms, would be carried through the streets, followed by father and the altar boys, all vested, wrapped in a cloud of incense. Next, the little girls in their communion dresses and veils, and last, the faithful. Everyone singing, No volume Dio, we want our God, while walking back to the church. Once St. Anthony was back in his place next to the altar, the play would begin. She had given it a great deal of thought to signing the parts. St. Anthony, so holy and so good, would be played by her husband, Frank. The Angel by Matt Morelli. The banky, Banker, Sam Speranza, would play the judge. Dominic DeLoya would be the perfect lawyer. He loved to talk. And St. Anthony's stern father would be played by Frank Mastro Francesco. A large group of men from the church were the Roman soldiers. The long-suffering saint would be taunted and tormented by a pack of little devils she had carefully cast from among the most mischievous boys in Swede Hollow. But what would she do about Patsy Moroni? 
She thought of his sweet, dark eyes looking up at her. He so badly wanted to be included, to do all the, the other things that the boys, other boys did. He was a good boy and smart, but he was totally deaf. He never spoke. Could he be a little devil in this play? She had to think of something. And with that, she put pen to paper again. The Life of St. Anthony, Part 2. Patsy Moroni ran as fast as his little legs could carry him to the big tree in the Sand Shelley's yard. He would not cry. He would not. Through tears were close to bursting from his heart. He scrambled up into the crook of the tree. He was still small enough to fit and nestled into its sheltering arms. He could not cry. He needed to put the hurt inside so he could think. Once again, the boys refused to let him come with them to the railroad trestle to feed the pigeons who nestled in the girders. Even the Sanchelli boys, Noah and Mikey, they shook their heads no firmly in the sign language they had devised to communicate with Patsy. They pulled the cord on an imaginary whistle and rolled their arms in a circle to warn him of the moving train. And with a sharp chop at their knees, they let him know the dire consequences of getting hit. And they stopped their ears to show him why he could not come. He couldn't hear. True, he could not hear. But he could see. And he could smell the smoke from the stack. And he could feel. He would feel the vibrations on the tracks long before any of them heard the whistle. He longed to see the pigeons. He wanted so badly to touch their soft feathers, to watch them in flight, wings outspread, to hold them and feel their beating hearts. Too dangerous? Who did they trust to be their lookout when they were stealing rolls from the bakery but the little deaf boy? Quick as a cat, quiet as a mouse. Don't worry, Patsy, they signed with a dismissive wave of the hand. Even if you get caught, they'll never hurt a little deaf kid. He could hold back the tears no longer. He cried himself out and then decided to take action. He climbed out on the big limb that hung over the creek, and from there he could see Signora Sanchelli, Antonetta, talking with a group of women and hanging laundry on the clothesline they all shared, white linens and lace. Could these be the altar clothes and vestments for the procession? Several mothers there scrubbing until their hands were red and chapped as their boys would look like angels. So much the better. He had a plan that would make them all see him and know that he was just one of the boys. He could be as naughty as any of them. He'd have to do a little acting, but hey, he was acting all the time. True, he loved Antonetta, who was always so kind and loving, and he hated to cause her any worry. But he had to teach those boys a lesson. He shinned down from the tree, he wiped his eyes, and headed over to the clothesline. As soon as he got close enough to be seen, he gathered up all his courage, took a deep breath, and then ran to Antonetta, throwing his arms around her legs and burying his face in her dress, sobbing loudly, he hoped. What's the matter, bambino? Antonetta cried, holding his face in her gentle hands. His dark, soulful eyes met hers. He almost wavered. Could he do this to his friend? And then slowly, he raised his arms and pointed to the railroad trestle. With signs known to all of them, he told them the boys were on the tracks feeding the birds. He covered his ears to show that they didn't hear the train. He mimicked the train whistle blowing and the wheels going round and round. And then, with a dramatic flourish worthy of the great Valentino, he opened his eyes wide with fright, drew a finger across his throat and held for just a moment and then crumpled to the ground. Madonna mia. The mothers yelled. What did you do to little Patsy? 
Dropping piles of wet clothes, hands in prayer, they ran for the trestle. Antonetta caught Patsy's hand, pulling him along. There were the boys and the birds, each one whole, blissfully unaware. Their mothers ran to them and held them close, crying tears of relief over their heads and of their confused little ones. At last, all eyes turned to Patsy, standing tall, feet a little apart, arms folded across his chest, jaw set, staring at the boys holding the birds. Now assured that their precious boys were unharmed, these hard-working women, in one combined chorus of Italian motherhood, pushed their sons from them and demanded, What did, what did you, you do, do to Patsy? Antonetta knew what had happened. She called her sons over to her. Did you boys send Patsy away when you came to feed the birds? See, Mom, we did not want him to get hurt. But you hurt him in another way. Go and get one of the pigeons and show him how to hold it. Help him to feed it and to toss it into the sky. She took Mikey's hand and put Patsy's hand in it, and the two walked away toward the trestle. They watched as Mikey put a small bird into Patsy's little hand. He stroked its feathers and felt its beating heart as it ate from Mikey's hand, and then he released it into the air and watched it soar. He smiled his sweet smile, and all was forgiven. Mrs. Orlando was simply radiant with joy. What a perfect day it had been. The Verde Band had mastered a beautiful song and led everyone through the streets singing. The play was a huge success. Everyone did their part as though they were born for it. St. Anthony triumphed and shone with a holy glow she had never seen in her husband before. But her highest praise went to Patsy Moroni, taunting and tormenting with the other boys, really giving St. Anthony a hard time. Patsy had proven that he, too, could be a little devil, and a good one. Just a word about Patsy Moroni. He and his whole family, he was a real character, and he was really deaf, and they really did have some kind of a sign language that they devised uh, so that they could communicate with him, and he was as smart as a whip. My grandma talked about him all the time. Um, later, the family moved here from our region of Campania, uh, but the father, through a misunderstanding, got into some trouble and they deported the entire family. And when we went to Italy in 2003 or 2005, one of those years, um, we were in our little region and someone told us that the Moroni family did pretty well once they got back to Italy. <laughs> I was very relieved to hear it because I, we had all fallen in love with Patsy. <laughs> and speaking of my grandmother, the best storyteller I have ever known was my, grand my grandmother, Antonetta. She drew from the finest sources, the Old Testament, Italian folklore, daily life in Sweet Hollow, lives of the saints and martyrs, <laughs> operas, soap operas, which she thought were real, her own imagination. Her voice was soothing yet expressive, but what made the stories uniquely hers was her wonderful broken English. Here are some examples. And a translation. Sit down and sit down. I'm going to make you a little sandwich. I'll make you a little sandwich. Eating was the solution to every problem. OK, we're going to have a little glass of wine. Same. Close the switch. Turn off the light. Use the mapin. Use your napkin or dish towel. Mapina, I think. Bring me the handkerchief. The handkerchief. Are you kids in the manias? You gonna get the worms? <laughs> Citrate of magnesium which is Italian Alka-Seltzer in a blue bottle, brioche. It fizzes in your mouth. 
We grabbed a handful every time we passed through the short hallway from the kitchen to the living room. Ditto Parmigiana, same warning, you're going to get worms. <laughs> Nancy, you go to the store, get a big loaf of Roma bread, a pound of Oli. Nancy, go to the store and get a loaf of Roma bread and a pound of oleo margarine. Also, uh, oh, go ahead. Also, freshly grated Parmesan. If I was lucky, grated on the radagas. Here is how she cut a slice of bread. She held the loaf vertically, the long way, against her body, grabbed the biggest knife she had, which was really big and kept very sharp, and began sawing toward the body. <laughs> and we held our breath every time, certain she would eventually saw herself in half. She chose to cry and pray and cry and pray. She just cried and prayed, cried and prayed, said while swaying back and forth, hands in upright prayer position, used to describe a girl caught in a tough predicament in a story, or sometimes dis describing herself in a quandary, or in response to grandpa's litany of the saints, which was calling down curses on the heads of all the saints he could think of. I'm going to go to the church. I'm going to church, daily after slapping her old navy blue silk hat squarely on her head. She put the hat on to go to Damiani's as well. For every day, she just wore a makadu. Okay, let's a yamazane. Okay, let's go home. We think it's a variation of andiamo alla cena. Let's go have supper. Chui, go down to chuka chuka, get to some chamega. <laughs> Joey, Go down to the new kin chu and get some chow mein. A special treat. Angelina, I'm on a divorce this step. Ma! From our favorite story, Angeline, I'm on the first step. And the terrified little girl cries out for her mother, done in a really spooky voice. And though we all knew the story's happy end, we shivered in dread every time we heard the story, which would be a million times. <laughs> and last, the words we love to hear the most. Once upon a time in the forest. Once upon a time in the forest. And off we went into another world. A bunch of kids with their beloved grandmother. There was a time when I thought that I was, well, all of us were too good for this song. This is called Shut Up You Face. <laughs> and I didn't like it because I thought it made Italians look like a bunch of palookas. The trouble is, these are all phrases that we heard growing up. I don't know why I thought this was unreal, but, and Joe Dolce did a darn good job of it. But this is Mark Stillman. Sing along if you know it, you surely know all the phrases. Hello, I'm a Giuseppe. I got uh, something uh, special for you. Uno, two, three, quattro. When I was a boy, just about the eighth grade, Mama used to say, don't stay out the late with the bad boys. Always shoot the pool. Giuseppe, you're going to flunk a school. That's better. Boy, you're making me sick just to make a lousy buck. Got to feel like a fool. That's Boy, you ain't making me sick. Can't get the neck to kick. And the mama used to say, what's the matter, you? Got no respect. What do you think you do? Why you look so sad? It's a not so bad. It's a nicer place. Ah, shut up, you face. That's my mama. Now, we used to sing. The words are really simple. I say, what's the matter, you? And you all say, hey. And in the end, we all say, Shut up, you face. <laughs> Here we go. What's the matter, you? Got the no respect. What do you think you do? Why you look so sad? That's not so bad. It's a nicer place. Ah, shut up, you face. <laughs> Big accordion solo.
He's better on the recording. What's the matter, you? Got to know respect. What do you think you do? Why are you looking so sad? It's a not so bad. It's a nice place. Ah, shut up. If he's... One more time for the mama. What's the matter, you? Got to know respect. What do you think you do? Why you look so sad? It's not so bad. It's a nicer place. Ah, shut up, you face! This is called The Robbery. On the worst day of her life, little Amelia Caruso learned that her father had died in a terrible accident at the railroad yards where he worked. Up until that day, 10-year-old Amelia and her mother and father lived happily together in a little house in Sweet Hollow, right there at the end of the tunnel. Her mother held her close. Carissima, she said softly, your father is gone. Now we have to do things in a different way. Mr. Miller is going to come let me work for him in the afternoons in the store up on the street. Some days when you come home from school, I won't be here. Listen carefully, Karamia. If I'm not here, you make yourself something to eat and then you do your homework. When it gets dark, you go into your room, maybe read a book, and you wait for me. Don't open the door to anyone. If you get scared, run across the garden to Antonetta Saukeli and wait for me at her house. Capish? See, si, Mama, said the little girl. In a shack right next to the Caruso house lived a young man named Pete Swanson. Pete was one of those guys, and we all know at least one, who spent all of his time and energy staying out of work. According to Pete, work was for chumps. He often bragged to his pool hall buddies, if you just keep your eyes and ears open, you can make plenty of money without lifting a finger. Let the other guy do the work. One day, not so long after the accident, Pete was laying around his house trying to think of a way to scare up a little cash when he heard a curious thing. He could clearly hear a car coming down through the tunnel. Not many cars drove into Sweet Hollow. He got up to check it out and was surprised to see a beautiful sleek black car pull up right in front of the Caruso house. Two men got out of the car, both dressed in dark suits, sporting neckties and two-toned shoes and wearing hats, not caps real fedoras. One man was carrying a large briefcase and they knocked at the door of the Caruso house and Senora Caruso let them in. After a little while they came out, the man put the briefcase down, both men shook hands with Mrs. Caruso and they picked up the briefcase and waved to her, got into the car, she waved back dabbing at her eyes with her apron and off they drove. Hmm, Pete thought scratching his chin. What was that all about? Two dandies in a briefcase here? Pete didn't know much about his neighbors or about money or about anything really, but he knew who did, the women of Sweet Hollow. Go to where they gathered and gathered to work and just listen in. He grabbed his cap and headed down to the bread oven where he found Mary Barilla and Dora Minocchio, two sisters, busily baking bread and chattering away. He circled in close and he heard snippets of the conversation. Oh, poor Teresa Caruso. What's she going to do now she lose her husband? How's she going to put food on the table? No husband. What happened? Almost as if they heard his thoughts, they obliged. Didn't you hear? Mary said in a conspiratorial whisper. The railroad going to give her some money. Money? How much? but his luck ran out. The bread was baked and the two women got busily pulling it out of the oven, leaving all thoughts of the Caruso fortune to Pete. But he needed to know more. He quickly rounded the path and walked up to the clothesline where he hit pay dirt. There they were, the Gumaris, they were called, three old birds and ran everything in Sweet Hollow, led by their leader, Tia Nicolina, and those hens were a cluckin'. He could hardly keep up. Nicolina, her hands together in prayer, lamented that poor Signore Caruso lost his life just trying to do his job. But, she said, the railroad gonna give her some money. 
$4,000. The railroad gonna give Teresa $4,000? See, she told me. Two guys came to her house in a big car. Madonna mio, $4,000. What's she gonna do with the money? They must have brought the money in the briefcase, the women continued. Talking from that point on, but Pete could, all Pete could hear was $4,000. His troubles were over. He just needed to get his hands on that money. He ran up onto the street and ducked into the pool hall. Anybody seen Mick? He shouted all and sundry, but trying hard to keep the excitement out of his voice. He's up on the brewery looking for a job, someone answered, and Pete was off. He found Mick in a long line of applicants that, to Mick's annoyance, roughly pulled him aside. Keeping his voice low, Pete explained the Caruso situation, and then quieter still, how the two of them were going to be rich men because of it. So, he whispered, here's the plan. You come to my house, wear the darkest clothes you have, and bring a big sack. The old lady goes to work in the afternoon, so as soon as it gets dark, we go in and take the money. Simple as that. Simple, of course, to anyone who knew as little about money as Pete and Mick. Pete had no idea what $4,000 looked like, nor where anyone would keep it. He figured it sat on piles in the Caruso house floor, and Senora Caruso just took the bills off the top of the stack when she needed to spend them. For his part, Mick was always regarded, as Pete, always regarded Pete as the brains of the outfit, and with a moment's hesitation, went along with the plan such as it was. By dusk, the boys were dressed and ready to go, and Mrs. Caruso had left for work, and the hollow was almost dark, and Pete, keeping watch at the window, declared that the coast was clear. Let's go, he ordered with a kind of whispered shout. They crept across the yards and pushed through the locked door. Amelia, studying in her room, heard the door give way. Her heart lurched into her throat, but she remembered her mother's instructions. She quietly dimmed the little kerosene light, moved into a corner of the room close to the window, and listened. She heard footsteps and furniture being tossed to the floor, and then the sound of angry whispers. Where's the money? One voice demanded. It must be in another room. You check the kitchen, I'll take the closet. More footsteps, more furniture crashing to the floor. Dishes breaking. The boy started to argue. Where's the money? I thought this was going to be simple. Well, how do I know where the old bat's keeping it? And so on. Under the cover of their angry, loud whispers, Amelia quietly slid the window open, just enough for her small body to slip through it, and ran as fast as her little legs could carry her across the garden and into the Sao Kelly's yard. Tears streaming down her face, she threw her arms around Antoinetta, who was talking across the fence with her neighbor, Maria Deloya. Signora, the breathless little girl began. Two guys broke into her house and they're looking for money. What? Who? The women asked, incredulous. Poor Teresa, Maria cried. She don't got enough trouble now. She got to worry about someone stealing her money and scaring her little bambina. Well, they're not going to get away with it, whoever they are. And with that, Maria started looking around for a weapon, and her eyes landed on about an 18-inch chunk of an old two-by-four where the edge of it was kind of off, and it fit just perfect into her hand. She grabbed it, she raised it above her head, armed for battle. Maria Aspeta! yelled Antoinetta. We gonna get the policeman. Maria said, okay, out loud. To herself, she said, the policeman can have what's left of him. And with that, she pulled herself up to four feet, 10 inches of righteous indignation, wielding the two by four of vengeance. And she strode into battle. She walked across the garden. She threw open the door of the Caruso's house, and to her surprise and fury, who did she see wrecking the house but her neighbor, Pete Swanson. Pete Swanson, you are a bad boy, she yelled. You mama gonna cry in her grave. And with that, she started swinging the two by four. 
On the downstroke, she got Pete right across the back of the knees and sent him sprawling to the floor. And off the upswing, she got Mick right in the back of the shoulders and sent him sprawling to the floor. And every time they got up, she'd smack him down again. And they'd <laughs> scrabble back up and she'd hit him again, swinging everywhere she could go. Finally, they were able to scrabble themselves over to the door, somehow get their feet underneath them, throw the door open, and out they went. Maria right on their footsteps, swinging that two by four and yelling for all she was worth until the boys ran right into the arms of the St. Paul police. Still, she kept swinging <laughs> until she heard Antonetta yell, Maria, Maria, basta, basta, stop, stop. You're going to kill him. Then the policeman can't take him to jail. <laughs> well, that stopped her. Those boys were going to jail right where they belonged. And with a sigh, she lowered the two by four of vengeance. All was quiet for a moment while people caught their breath until they heard a little girl cry, Mama! And they looked up to see Teresa Caruso running down the tunnel, gathering her precious Amelia into her arms. The policeman handcuffed the boys, now relieved to be safe from that crazy woman, and started to lead them away when Pete turned around and said, Senora Caruso, you gotta tell me, where'd you hide the money? Oh, Pete Swanson, you silly boy. The money is in Mr. Speranza's bank, so nobody can steal it from me. <laughs> Epilogue. Pete Swanson never did make a big score, never did find his fortune right around the corner, but he did spend his life trying. Mick did his time, then got back in the employment line at the brewery. Whenever he was tempted to stray from a straight and narrow path, he thought of Maria DeLoya and her two-by-four and headed right back to work. <laughs> Senora Caruso and Emilia moved up on the street, and in Sweet Hollow, everything went back to normal. This is just a little uh, digression here. Um, it's going to be a little toast to our beloved Mario Lanza. Like most men of his time, my father had only one day a week to rest from his labors. And so on Sunday mornings, he would quickly get up, get ready for mass, get out of the way, so the rest of us could fight over the bathroom. And as we were getting ready, he was gathering up his records and listen, getting lost in the world of his favorite songs sung by his favorite tenors. There was Richard Crooks, The Holy City. Last night I lay a-sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there, etc. There was Jan Pierce, the bluebird of happiness. And Jan didn't just sing about the bluebird of happiness. Jan stopped in the middle of the song and talked to us about the bluebird of happiness. And there was Yussi Bierling. Boy, that Swede can really sing, my dad would say with a sigh. And he was right. But these guys, as wonderful as they were, were just the warm-up act. The main attraction every Sunday was the incomparable Mario Lanza. The voice so warm, so lovely, so powerful. The pleasant and unassuming manner and a life story shared by so many of us Italian-Americans, Jews, Greeks, Poles, a kid who rose from the humblest beginnings, a little store in Philadelphia to become Il Divo, an international star. He was Pagliacci, he was Caruso, he was the student prince. He kept our Italian music alive for us. We learned all our Neapolitan songs from him. But, like so many superstars, Mario fell out of fashion. By the time I became a university music student, he was dead and his legend tarnished. His voice, his repertoire, his lavish lifestyle, all seemed irrelevant and old-fashioned in this Cold War reality we were living in, the world of the avant-garde, where all meaning was meaninglessness, 
where there was no form but formlessness, where music was nothing but black notes on a white page, all else was sentimentality. I was a very good music student, but I wasn't a very courageous music student. And so I stood by quietly and let Mario be ridiculed for singing with passion and beauty, never coming to the defense of the singer who taught me and so many others better than me to sing like you mean it. And by that I mean inspiration and first teacher to Placido Domingo, Luciano Pavarotti, Jose Carreras, and so many others. But I'm here to say that I'm not as wimpy as I used to be. And I want to say publicly, thank you, Mario. He sang sad songs for the brokenhearted. He sang happy songs for times of joy, nostalgic songs for those who longed. And for those in love, he made it the loveliest night of the year. And he sang them all in tune with a powerful and beautiful tone, with passion and with respect. Be my love, Torna Sorrento, La Danza, and Golden Days. So, music snobs, go ahead and sniff at his excesses and call his music dated. Purists, feel free to listen to Caruso on your crackly old 78s. As for me, I'll take Mario and his sentimental songs on the hi-fi. And so in honor of our beloved Mario Lanza, let's sing O Solo Mio. Salute Mario, salute Marco. The next story started out life with the title of Make a Cross, but it morphed into something else. It is now called the Double Cross. Or in Italian, Doppio Croce, the Double Cross. 
All in all, things were going pretty well in Sweet Hollow that summer. The weather was good, gentle, and forgiving. The rain came when it was needed, but otherwise stayed away, leaving the sun to work its magic, making the small gardens abundant with tomatoes and cucumbers, peppers and herbs, and so much zucchini, its blossoms so lovely and delicious. The babies were born healthy and stayed that way. The children, skinny and tough, roamed the hollow without a care. The women, of course, worked from sunup to sundown, as they always did. But that summer, the men found work too, and that made all the difference. The railroad, the brewery, and the stockyards, and the produce farms just outside of the city were all hiring. The men of Sweet Hollow were working again, proud and grateful to be able to provide for their families. Early each morning, Domenico Bartoni, along with some of the other men and some of the older boys, rode the streetcar out to Little Canada to work all day in the fields. This was the work they knew well. In Italy, they were the contadini, the farmers, and the work suited them. And the contract was simple, come to work every day, and at the end of the week, each worker received an envelope containing cash money, immediately spendable, but times were changing. One Friday afternoon, Domenico Bartoni lined up to collect his pay and was surprised and a little bit angry to see that the envelope contained not cash, not coins, but a little slip of paper. Que cosa? he demanded to know. This is your paycheck, the paymaster explained. It belongs to only you. No one can rob you or take that money. See, it says here your name, when you worked, and how much you earned. Domenico was too embarrassed by his illiteracy to press for an explanation. Completely confused and desperate for an answer, he took his envelope to his cousin, Antonetta Sancelli, a kind and patient woman, blessedly literate in both Italian and English. What am I going to do with this piece of paper, he shouted. I got a wife and a kids. I needed my cash. Basta, basta, Domenico, ascolta, she explained. This piece of paper is a colored check. You're going to take this piece of paper to the farmer and merchant bank, and Mr. Speranza will cash the check, but you give him the paper, and he gives you the money, but you got to put your name on the back of the check. Domenico confessed to Antonetta that he, like so many others, could not write his name. This is okay, she said. You bring a with you, a witness, he's going to tell the bank who you are, and then he signed his name for you. Gabish? See, he said, although he didn't really understand. Hey, Vero, how could this be? She continued to explain the process. You turn the check over, take the pencil, and you make the crotch, the cross, but you got to lean over like this and write. See, that's you signing your name, see? See, he said, not signing it all, not seeing it all. But don't forget to bring the witness, otherwise you don't get your money. Domenico ran to the bread oven to grab his paisano Mariano by the arm. Mariano, you got to come with me right away to the Speranza Bank, and you got to tell him my name, Andiamo. So being that Domenico really had no idea what was going on, he really couldn't explain it to Mariano, but it seemed to him that Mariano's job was pretty easy, pretty simple, if not a little strange. Still, he insisted that they practice on the way to the bank. Mariano, Domenico asked, what's my name? I got to tell you your name? What are you, Potts? You got the Malocchio? You crazy? No, 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 Mariano, Domenico persisted. Try it again. Act like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> they tried again. Mariano, what's my name? Domenico, he said with authority. Domenico Bartoni, now you know. See, Domenico explained. And I'm going to give you this piece of paper when they arrived to the bank. The, the, I'm sorry, the, they arrived at the bank and a very pleasant woman asked if she could help them. See, said Domenico, I'm going to give you this piece of paper 
and you're going to give me the money. Of course, she said. And she looked at the name and the amount and then turned the check over. Just sign your name right here. Mariona watched in wonder as his friend, quite obviously afflicted with the evil eye, took the pen and started to make the cross and then leaned over a little bit and successfully wrote an X on the back of the check. Oh, I see, said the teller. And did you bring a witness? See, si, said Domenico, relieved that things were going just about the way Antonetta had said they would. Mariano, viene qui. Mariano stepped up and Domenico asked the question they had been rehearsing all the way to the bank. Mariano, what's my name? Domenico, Domenico Bartoni, Mariano shouted. The teller jumped back a little bit, surprised at the strength of his declaration, but soon recovered and said, good. Now, Mr. Mariano, if you will just sign your name right here below Mr. Bartoni's X. Ah, Mariano thought, I get it now. He took the pen and began to make the cross, just like Domenico. And then the teller said, oh, I'm sorry, guys, but I've got to have the witness sign the back of the check before I can cash it. One signature, she said, had to be written out. And they were all in, in wonderment that nothing was going the way they had been told. But this was the summer of good fortune and their luck held because just at that moment, Signora Speranza entered the bank. Mr. Speranza's family had come to St. Paul many years before with the first wave of Italian immigrants and he knew the stories of hope and struggle his countrymen had brought with them to this new and confusing land. And he did whatever he could to help them get back on their feet. Buongiorno, Signora, come stai? He said, extending a fist a hand first to Domenico and then to Mariano. Che cosa? he asked, picking up the check. Everyone began to talk at once, in Italian, in English. Basta, basta, he said, holding up his hand. All eyes were fixed on Mr. Speranza, Speranza as he turned the check over and signed his name in full beneath the two X's of his two friends. Miss Anderson, he declared, this is Signor Domenico Bartoni and Signor Mariano and I will be his witnesses. And with that, Miss Anderson handed Domenico his well-earned pay. With gratitude and wonder, Domenico left the bank with Mariano arm in arm, and it's one of the few times in history that a double cross actually worked out. This story is called The Night of the Party, and it will involve all of us, including making his theatrical debut at St. Paul Brewing, Mark Stillman. <laughs> the Night of the Party. <laughs> there is an old Yiddish saying, men make plans, and God laughs. We're leaving Sweet Hollow now and moving up on the street to a little mom and pop grocery on the corner of Jesse and Minnehaha. A group of lifelong friends, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, <laughs> a young woman with an umbrella, each had plans for this little store on the night of the party. Part one, Joe. The year was 1942. The U.S. was at war in Europe and now also in the Pacific. Just a few years before, the Sancelli family, along with many of their Sweet Hollow neighbors, had achieved their common goal and moved up on the street, trading an address on Phelan Creek for one on Hopkins or DeSoto 
or Beaumont, or for the Sanchelis, 730 Jesse Street. Joe, the youngest of the Sanchelli boys, wanted to serve his country and follow his brothers into the army. He volunteered but failed the eye exam again and again. At last, the recruiter allowed him a moment to move close to the chart and memorize it. <laughs> but on the day he passed the eye exam, he failed the hearing test. <laughs> he was issued a two classification, which qualified him to work for the war effort in a non-combat capacity. He was told to report to a base in Washington State where he would be picked up by an Army transport plane for war production in Alaska. Joe's best buddy, Skip Alessi, planned a small goodbye party for Joe at his parents' little store right next to Joe's house. Just a few of the neighborhood boys, all destined for service, gathered together on the night before Joe's departure on the Northern Pacific to Washington. The plan was a simple one. Owner Sam Alessi would lock up the store a little early that night. Skippy would let the boys in the back door to the storeroom. There they could talk and joke over a beer and wish each other well, wherever the war took them. A simple plan. What could go wrong? <laughs> Part two, Sam Alessi. That afternoon, Sam Alessi walked a block up the street to the brewery to get a case of beer for the party. Most of the boys were under 21, but they were going off to war. What was the harm in raising a glass together, perhaps for the last time? Some 20 years before, Sam had come to this country from Italy and settled in Sweet Hollow alongside many of his countrymen. Though uneducated, he was a shrewd businessman who had a good nose for a good deal. When the Messina family decided to bury their still in a tunnel under the store and leave town, he brought their little grocery store on the corner of Minnehaha and Jesse. What he needed was a wife. He knew the Kumaris could fix him up with someone from Sweet Hollow or from Italy but what he really needed was someone with a good, who could speak good English. He had never really mastered the language. He decided to wind his search areas and so rode the streetcar to the other side of downtown to foreign territory, to the Midway. <laughs> and there Sam found Louise, a woman who was everything he needed in a wife. She was a hard worker, a loving mother to his little boy, and being American-born, spoke perfect English. There was one thing that troubled Sam a little bit, but he mostly chose to ignore it. She was herself a fine and upstanding woman, but she was from the Midway. From time to time, some rather shady characters appeared at the store, guys with names like Knuckles, and Muggsy, and Lefty. And one fateful day in 1942, with the war raging on two fronts, one of the guys, let's call him Noodles, showed up at the store with an offer for a good deal for Sam and Louise. He had a large stash of ration cards they could sell for a profit at the store. Of course, there would be a little kickback for Noodles. I'll need a little something for all the trouble I went through to get to these here. I'll come by and collect once a week, he explained through a haze of cigar smoke. But really, everybody wins, including your happy customers. Louise was a hard worker, but hardly a Wall Street financier. Sam's poor English limited his understanding of the deal to how much money he stood to make. Neither of them thought to inquire of Noodles where and how he came into possession of these desirable cards. And so they went into business together. For a time, all went according to plan until the night of the party. 
Part three, the FBI. <laughs> Discreetly parked on a side street across from the store was a shiny black sedan. In it, two men wearing trench coats and fedoras were carefully, carefully monitoring the comings and goings at the little grocery store, and they smelled a rat. His name was Noodles, a small-time crook well-known to the feds. They knew this much. Noodles had stolen the cards along with $1,600 from a bank in Shakopee, and he needed a place to launder them. A little corner grocery on the other side of town was just perfect. They'd been following Noodles and the cards for some time, and he had led them right to the Alessi store. They had some questions for mom and pop, and these guys met business. Questions about large criminal syndicates. Questions about wartime profiteering. Questions about what they knew and who they knew. You know, Noodles doesn't have the brains for the big time. Maybe the old lady's running the show, one of the muse, one of the G-men. We'll get to the bottom of it tonight, replied the other. Here's a plan. We wait until closing time, rush in, lock the owners in the back room, and start interrogating. Get them to put the finger on noodles. Arrest everybody. They were ready to strike. It was the night of the party. As Sam started to lock the front door, the two men, trench coats flapping open, guns drawn, burst through the door. They flashed their badges secured the door and herded Sam and Louise into the back room. To the G-men, things looked mighty suspicious. Closing up early, a case of beer, a bunch of young palookas hanging around the back door. They shouted orders. You two, they commanded, pointing their guns at Sam and Louise. Get over there in that corner. They turned to the boys. Sit down on the packing crates and don't try anything funny. Everything was in place, dead quiet. The questioning was about to begin when they heard a loud, persistent pounding on the back door. Part four, Nellie Sanchelli. <laughs> a Joy's younger sister, Nellie, worked the evening shift at the Walgreens downtown. She rode the streetcar to and from work. Rain or shine, she carried an umbrella with a long point on one end and a hook on the other, and she wasn't afraid to use it. Many a downtown Romeo had felt the business end of this umbrella and thereafter looked at her with new respect. Earlier in the evening, on the night of the party, one of the neighborhood boys had stopped in at the store for a package of Beeman's gum. He spotted Nellie at the checkout and stopped to say hello. They chatted a bit, then he said, well, I guess I'll see you later at the party. What party is that, she inquired. Uh, oops, he said, and headed for the door. She snagged him by the elbow with the crook of that umbrella, dragged him back and said, all right, let's have it. Reluctantly, he gave her the sketchiest of details, then headed once again for the door, and this time, he made it. Well, she still had a few hours left till her shift was over, so that gave her plenty of time to brew up a fine stew of righteous indignation. They didn't invite me to the party! <laughs> Self-pity. They didn't invite me to the party! And pure anger. They didn't invite me to the party! And so, by the time she left for home, she was just longing to let somebody have it. A goodbye party for Joey, and they didn't invite her? What were they thinking? Then, already furious, she got onto the streetcar, and who was on it but George De La Rosa, the streetcar padre, hanging on to the strap for dear life, weaving all over the place, dressed in a rumpled dark suit, reeking of whiskey and preaching fire and brimstone down on the heads of anyone unlucky enough to be in the same compartment with him. Oh, how she longed to just give him a little poke with the umbrella and see if, like a popped balloon, he would just fly all over the place. But she couldn't. She needed to save her anger 
for the party. She got right off on the corner of Jesse and Minnehaha, saw that the front of the store was dark, and went around to the back, clutching the umbrella. The back door was locked. She began to pound on the door with all her might, shouting, this is Nellie, boom, boom, boom. You let me in, boom, boom, boom. I know you're in there, boom, boom, boom. Hey, caught it at sea, boom, boom, boom. And on it went until at last the door was opened just a crack by a strange man. You let me in, she shouted, and she tried to push her way in. If you come in here, you're going to have to stay in, he warned. You let me in, my brother's in there, and she raised the umbrella. She stepped back a foot just to give herself a little forward momentum to shove her way through the door when the man opened the door, stepped aside, and let her through. All right, now you're in, you're staying in. But she barely heard him. She saw the boys, all sitting in a line on packing crates, and marched over to them. They were all there, the scoundrels. Andrew Mazzaro, Tucker Monocchio, Skip Alessi, Sammy DeLoya, the Steels, Blaney Markey, Freddie Barilla, the whole stupid gang. <laughs> she stood in front of them. She took a deep breath and commenced the shouting and berating. Did you really think you could have a party for my brother without me? Smack. Did you really think I wouldn't find out? Smack. And on it went, every question punctuated with a sharp bump of the umbrella on the floor. A visual exclamation point. <laughs> she stopped for just a minute to reload when she noticed that the boys were not arguing with her. In fact, they weren't even looking at her. Their eyes were fixed on something or someone behind her. She turned around and saw the man who had opened the door. A tall man in a trench coat, hands on hips, shoulder holster with a gun, flashing a badge. What's going on? She demanded. That's what we're here to find out. He gently but firmly removed the umbrella from her hand. And then she saw the light. You think these people are crooks? She shouted. They aren't even shifty enough to keep the party a secret. <laughs> Implied, but not said. How could you be so stupid? Well, the G-man looked at mom and pop. He looked at the wide-eyed boys. He looked at the wild young woman with the umbrella. He looked at his partner. He was beginning to think she could be right. Well, I got to get home, she said. My mother's expecting me. She has enough to worry about with my brother leaving tomorrow for Alaska. You should have thought of that before you insisted on coming in. Now go sit down. She went over and sat down next to her brother. She was beginning to think the G-man was right. What a night. What a party. Part 5, The End of the Party. It took the greater part of that night, but the G-men did get to the bottom of the card caper. Noodles and the $1,600 were never found. The ration cards were confiscated. Sam and Louise were fined. Their son Skippy was told that he could clear the records by going to the Army, which he did. Joey got on the train the very next morning to begin his great Alaskan adventure. A year later, Nellie, too, would be on the train to Washington State to do a stint as a Rosie the Riveter at a military base. True Detective magazine printed a very sensationalized version of the story, much to the embarrassment of Sam and Louise, but no one would have recognized them from this telling. And that is how the story has come down through our family. But I often wonder, how did the FBI tell the stories to their family or their bosses? How did they explain what happened on the night of the party? My cousin Jerry, otherwise known to us as the Bard of Venice, Florida, <laughs> and most fam his most famous poem is called, She's Not As Odd As She Used To Be. <laughs> But he also wrote one called The Stories of Sweet Hollow, and his daughter is going to read it for us. And then we'll have a little toast to Uncle Mikey. For many generations, the immigrants came, perhaps seeking fortune or maybe fame. 
to find America where they could be free. Some settled in Sweet Hollow on St. Paul's east side, working hard to build a new life with pride. Swedes, Italians, Hispanics, and others, they learned to live together as sisters and brothers. They struggled mightily and made do with little. Their existence was meager, their security was brittle. They shared resources to stay alive. They relied on each other just to survive. There was no running water, no indoor plumbing. And in winter, the cold was numbing. They built a thriving, vibrant community, a foundation of fellowship and unity. Immigrants who sought assimilation into the citizenship of their new nation. To their children, they stressed civility and the value of personal responsibility, as well as an education to achieve a success. They could not accept anything less. Sweet Hollow was never a paradise, but they were grateful and didn't think twice about materialism because they were free in this place of great opportunity. America is greater because they came to it and brought their strength, courage, and grit. Theirs is a history of simple, silent stories, glories, excuse me, kept alive by their many sweet, hollow stories. If you're wondering at all about the apron, I don't always dress like this. <laughs> uh, <they are. laughs> this is an homage to our grandmothers. Always the apron over the head, the faded out flowered pattern. We couldn't find one that was quite that worn out. I suppose they wore them till they were in shreds. But this was pretty darn close and it puts you in the mood. Um, I'd just like to give acknowledgments again so everybody knows who is who. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. It's so much more fun to share stories with other people who love stories. Again, the tellers were Samantha Hurd, Jerry Hurd, Sarah Renner, Nancy Sanchelli Girton, our accordionist, Mark Stillman. Many thanks to Tim Zorni and to Saint, our friends from St. Paul Neighborhood Network and to our wonderful friends from St. Paul Brewing who have hosted us yet again. We're going to give the last word this afternoon to, my, to our story angel, Mike Sanchelli. I found these words of advice at the end of a long piece he wrote called Sweet Hollow, Our Own Little Playground. And this is what he said, quote, Something was always happening somewhere in Sweet Hollow most of the time, but my eyes could account only for what I saw, and the same goes for my memory. So, if you are a former resident of Sweet Hollow and reading these pages brought something back to your memory, put it on paper for someone else to read! Exclamation point. The early years of the 20th century in Sweet Hollow were tough, but interesting. Also, the many pictures that are laying around will someday be lost forever. Don't lose them, use them! Exclamation point. If we had the cameras that people have today, we wouldn't have to write. The pictures could tell the tale of years gone by. I have to disagree, Uncle Mike. No picture could match your priceless words in bringing Sweet Hollow to life for us. Thank you again so much. <laughs>